Tucker Security EO. All right. That's all right. Driving this whole uh, uh, software bill materials world. Cyclone DX was its own standards group that merged with OWASP to get scale around interoperable S bonds uh, and things of that nature. Um, we work with other standards groups or certification groups to create standards that are derivative of OWASP. So uh, if you use like the ring doorbell uh, and, and um, uh, pretty much everybody other than Apple is part of this community you never heard of called IOXT. IOXT is actually an IoT certification regime uh, for IoT device security. We work with them to help create something called a mobile protection profile, which is basically um, a certification regime for mobile apps connecting to things. So like the mobile app on your phone that is the Ring Doorbell app. Um, and that's actually derivative of the OWASP MA SVS and MSTG in terms of creating that. So the, what's actually happening is the OWASP MA SVS standard is now growing its way through other industries and verticals. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that at the tail end. Um, on Wednesday of this week, Two days from today, you will see this announcement that there is a new Google Android certification standard coming out. It is also derivative of the OWASP MASBS. It's part of the App Defense Alliance that's sponsored by Google, and I'm going to hit a little bit of that at the tail end today uh, to make that visible to you as well. So um, we also work a lot with the open source community. So if you're into reversing, you may have heard of Frida or Radari. So the creators of Frida and Radari are on our team. And these are kind of the secret sauce and our tools and our pen testing services that we use. Uh, if you want to learn about reversing, there's um, uh, we have some academy courses you can learn from us, leverage the tooling. Uh, we typically run advanced Fred and Radari tooling classes at things like Black Hat for people who are serious reverse engineers. Uh, so anyway, so that's a little bit about kind of who we are. Every once in a while, uh, we get involved in responsible disclosures. And uh, so this one's just kind of interesting if you're a Peloton fanatic. Um, one of our security researchers and his wife were Peloton fanatics and he started fiddling with it and discovered some pretty nasty things. Um, so we've been working with Peloton for the last six months and had some recent responsible disclosures wrapped around those. We've also worked on things like cars, gas grills, uh, assorted other things. It seems the researchers like things and hacking those in their spare time. So, but that's not really our primary business. Our primary business really is a combination of software and services for uh, mobile application security. So what's interesting about this space for us and for me is um, I've been in mobile since BlackBerry. So that's 15, almost 20 years. But if I go back before that, I was a web and PC application guy. Um, I got to appreciate security when I ran QA um, and was trying to understand, you know, usability and quality and sort of in the earlier days, of client server or pre-client server security was just sort of do you authenticate or not? Um, you know, obviously with uh, commercial open networks, that whole world changed pretty dramatically uh, and eventually got sucked into the mobile world. So we benchmark the app stores. So in our work in analyzing the millions of apps in the um, Apple App Store and the Google Play, we do analysis. And like other horror story benchmarks you've seen around things like the web top 10, uh, we find about 85% of all the apps in the commercial app store uh, violate one or more of the OS top 10. Some of them are pretty bad, and I'll show you a few of those just for fun today. Um, so what we're really doing in an event like this today is sort of teaching people about the spec uh, and helping we get more professionals who would be interested in getting into mobile security and bring mobile security practices into their organizations because the quality when you look at an application or you think about mobile apps, most people think about quality is what's the user experience uh, and don't necessarily know that uh, Park Mobile uh, has been hacked and 21 million credentials and credit cards were stolen or 300,000 Walgreens prescriptions were stolen. And so what's happening is the bad guys have figured out how to access data through mobile applications because the high proportion of them that are insecure over the network. And because there is no antivirus on your phone, there's no way for you to detect the malicious actor or nefarious activity on your phone. Unlike a PC where you might be running antivirus or you might have network sniffing tools when, you're, when your laptop's on the network or a VPN. So um, what we're trying to do is help folks improve that. So this is one of my, my fun pictures. I update this every year. So uh, I'm betting some of you have apps like these on your phone or certainly know the companies um, from that perspective. And what's always interesting about this is to play the game of 
which ones have had breaches in the last two years. <laughs> and I will say it's not all of them. So uh, interestingly enough, uh, I need to add uh, Amazon Ring. There it is. Uh, just had another one. Um, and so Slack last year, you may have heard about the credential crunch through Slack, uh, Twitter, uh, even the Apple messaging infrastructure. Uh, My Fitness Pal is probably the most famous one. 150 million My Fitness Pal records were stolen. My Fitness Pal was written by students at the University of Texas. They sold their app to Under Armour and made a whole bunch of money on it. They had never actually performed a security test on it ever. <laughs> Under Armour, in their what diligence, never did a security analysis. And about 16 months after oh. Under Armour had scaled it out, they discovered that it was vulnerable. And that's how the very large breach. CIO, CISO, assorted other executives are gone. And now, interestingly enough, uh, my fitness has been spun off as its own entity. It's very secure and safe now. They're actually a customer of ours. We went in and cleaned it up. Um, but it's it's an example of you know when things go awry, they really go awry. We have some fun tools. So if if you're a masochist and you want to track breaches, we have a breach tracker page. Um, if you want to get a sense of what's going on in the app stores, we actually have uh, this mobile risk tracker. It's an anonymized aggregator of the risk scores we get out of the commercial app stores. So you can look up like gig economy mobile apps like Uber and all the rest, and you get some basic data about how good or bad they are. 100% of them fail one or more of the OS top 10, 91% of them leak private data somehow, somewhere that would concern somebody uh, and so on and so forth. So um, we, we don't lack for resources. So uh, quick question, does anybody have mobile security experience? A bit, a bit, all right. So um, the strategy with the OWASP uh, MASPS is really about sensitive data. So if we, if we equate loss of sensitive data or leakage of sensitive data with quality, then it's ultimately quality, but it's all about sensitive data, um, which is slightly different from the way um, the OSP web project is operated with the ASVS. And so you're gonna see that kind of shape as I go through the MASVS and how it's evolved. So um, one of the really interesting things for me around web versus mobile is I've sort of studied web as a reverse engineering, act, you know, reverse, um, exercise because I have the mobile expertise, but I don't have the deep web expertise. And when you drill in, you've got two operating systems that change every year. How often does a web operating system change? You have four dev languages that are constantly moving, but every quarter their API changes in the languages that Apple and Google put out. Plus you have all the variations of third-party tools, frameworks, and libraries. Um, and so this is a, a really sort of fast moving ecosystem. We're on iOS 15 and iOS 16 is in beta now. I don't think there are 16 versions of HTML. Job is cool. So that pace of movement is great because the innovation it drives, but it also drives new vulnerabilities and gaps in quality over time. So I'm gonna give you some examples of security uh, features that have been added by Apple and Google, but also places where new vulnerabilities were created as part of the classic evolution, natural evolution. So um, what operating system do you guys think is more secure, iOS or Android? iOS. Android. If you go to the CVE database, there's more CVEs for iOS than Android. If you look at CVEs year to date, it's twice as many iOS CVEs as Android. Android has done a ton of work to lock down the operating system. Apple started way ahead. And to a large extent, Android is sort of caught up. Um, that doesn't mean they both don't, they both don't have issues. It's just kind of the rate of change now has, has kind of shifted. Apple's doing some really innovative stuff around privacy. Um, and if you're tracking the FIDO Alliance, right, we're looking at password lists is coming uh, in probably the next major version of both uh, iOS and Android. And that'll be fascinating to see how that happens to the world, what that's all gonna mean. So um, to kind of point out, this is a screenshot from that white paper that's useful. You know, Web and mobile are clearly different in terms of how they behave. And I'm gonna kind of walk you through some of those differences. They're part of what creates a great user experience and part of what creates a great attack surface for the bad guys um, that generally developers don't understand. So when we do sort of basic training for whether it's a new security analyst who came from web or, or other less technical people, we often start with a diagram like this. 
And so when we think about a mobile app, it's really the combination of the app and the services that it uses, either in the cloud or on the back end. Uh, and so depending on the quality of the developer, they might write bad code or download bad third party libraries or operate bad services or have bad APIs on the back end that could either leak data or attack, uh, you know, exposed, be exposed to attack. The amount of data leakage is tremendous, um, especially on the storage side of the house. It's getting a little better on the network side of the house, but we'll show you some of that here coming through. So if we kind of carve it all the way down and think about, well, how do I want to attack if I say sensitive data is what matters, how do I want to create, a, create an organizing strategy for a mobile application and its dependent infrastructure? Well, there's the code that I write, there's the overall architecture of the app, there's data at rest, which is all the storage, there's data in motion, there's data in use, right? So that's on device, and then you have the API backends and they all kind of make the application. Now, if you think about a browser, if you encode your web application in a browser and use HTTPS, you get SSL for free. When you write an application that runs in a browser, you get to take advantage of security features that are built in the browser, right? When you write a mobile app, you gotta write it all. There is no browser. There aren't easy network libraries. And so the level of code that a developer has to write to create a mobile app is a lot more than a web app. As a result, the more code they write means it's more likely they will screw it up, right? That's just nature of code, right? So what is your defect rate per thousand lines of code? Well, if you're writing four times more lines of code on mobile, the odds of having a higher defect rate are naturally there. And what happens is in many instances, the mobile developers are focused on the user experience and the feature set. And they don't have a lot of the, the security skills in terms of writing secure code. So what I'm gonna go through today is I'm actually gonna show you the five most common security issues we find and how to help developers address them and how to help mobile security analysts test for them, right? Because we found that kind of bringing those two things together are a way to do it. What's really interesting is the recipe is very straightforward in terms of what to focus on. Although, you know, the, the overall scope of something like the OWASP and the SVS for mobile is very large, there's really five things you need to deal with. And that, that cleans up like 80%. So we got to deal with code here. We got to deal with handling data in REST. We got to deal with handling data in motion. We got to deal with handling the API backend, right? Now, if you're writing web apps, you know that matters. And the browser is going to take care of a bunch of this stuff. And for most browser apps, there isn't much storage. If there is storage, it's associated with management that the browser will deliver. So uh, lots of pictures. Um, so we're going to talk about the OS Mobile project. And the OS Mobile project basically has three primary assets to it. So you have the MASVS, it is the definition of the security standard. So it's a little bit long uh, and it's actually written in a way that both a security analyst and an application developer should be able to read it and understand it. So think of it as developer friendly security language is effectively how it's written. The MSTG is that it is literally the list of how to test for the security requirements that are established in the standard. So they go hand in hand. This is how to write your code, this is how to test it. And then there's a checklist, which is literally every test in here lives in spreadsheet, right? So you can go crank on the checklist and use that as part of your testing program or methodology. So um, these are all going through update right now. So there was a major update to automatically generate the checklist and sync it to the MSTG. So these two guys now live in tandem. So anytime there's a change in the testing guide, it automatically updates the checklist. It also makes it so you can use automation over here on the checklist. And checklist has, uh, exists in a couple of different instances, including you can pull from the Git repo and have SBOM generation occur for the test output to map to it if you want. But not SBOM, excuse me, JSON generation. So it lives in JSON as well as the sheet. Um, so I'm going to walk through each of these assets. There, every underline you see in here is a link. We'll give you a copy of the deck. You're going to find about 40 links in here to all kinds of resources um, to help you on the journey. So I'm going to tell a story. So when you think about the apps on your phone, is anybody worried about security of any of the apps on your phone? Do you ever think about it? Like, oh yeah. All the time. <laughs> so so TikTok, is that good or bad? Is TikTok good or bad? Bad. Bad. Why is TikTok bad? It's social media. Well, <laughs> okay, skip the social media part. It's owned by the Chinese. We're all older, so it's what? It's owned by the Chinese. 
Yep. So we have fantastic TikTok. It is reasonably secure, but we can't tell you where the data goes. Right. So now you get to decide is that safe or not. I'll show you a few other examples of, of certain applications here coming in a little while. So one of the things that was really interesting uh, in about 2015, 2016, as the original spec started to come together was this idea of there's different risk profiles or different threat models, and we can actually categorize mobile apps into four different types and then use that as a framework, right? So if you're building an app like for booking a conference room like this, you're not going to use the same level of development secure development, secure testing and pen testing and everything else as an app that's doing financial transactions. You're just not gonna do it. And so we wanted to have a very pragmatic model to it. So it starts with, uh, there's two levels and there's something called R that I'll get to. So the first level would be basic security, which even if you're not really storing much of anything, you should have basic security. So I'm gonna use healthcare. So uh, simple healthcare app, let's say that I have the WebMD app. What's WebMD? Well, you go into WebMD and you search on something. Doesn't store your user ID, doesn't store your password, has no PHI, it's just a simple little app. Yes, uh, WebMD was a train wreck for a while. We did two responsible disclosures and they cleaned it out. WebMD had a uh, mommy pregnancy baby health tracking feature in it that was yucky. So they have since fixed that. That used to be one of our fun, the WebMD baby app used to be one of our fun uh, demos. We called it, called the baby ugly. <laughs> so, um, so that's level one, right? So we've got this WebMD kind of what's going on you know, uh, how do you do it? Search frequently when COVID happened and all that other stuff. Now, I may have a different kind of app. So let's grow up from WebMD and let's say that I have an application that's like a, a healthcare monitoring app. So I'm a diabetic. I used to wear a diabetic attached device. I had a Medtronic app that talked to it from my phone. Um, and I'm recovering because I was able to get my insulin under control. So I have to wear it anymore. But that actually matters, right? It matters to me that someone can see what's going on in my health, right? So in this case, I'm just gonna use weight monitoring. So it's not injecting me with anything, it's just how's your weight. Well, that's PHI, I don't wanna have that leak. So I'm gonna do a higher degree of security because I don't want someone stealing my you know, scale measurements of BMI and weight and whatever else over time. It's not like end of the world, but it's not great if somebody got that information. So unlike web, Mobile has an interesting challenge, which, it's, which, which is it's easily attackable and reversible. So if you think about a web app, you have whatever bit of code it's going to live in the front end. It kind of gets downloaded dynamically. 90 to 95% of a web app lives behind a firewall and all those layers of hard, hardened infrastructure. Now, some of it could be in the cloud. Hopefully, you secured your cloud and your containers correctly. And some of it lives behind your firewall. And you got all these perimeter defense. Mobile app lives on your device. And developers put as much as they can in the mobile app because they want to reduce the round trips to the back end. So that means even more of your IP lives on the device, even more of the computation lives on your device. And it's easily reversible. So Freedom Radari, the tools I talked about earlier, yeah, we can rip open a DRM app from Apple and get pretty close to source. So when you can do that, and you can take an Apple app and get it all the way to Assembler, that's a whole nother ball game. That means a smart, sophisticated attacker can completely reverse your app, learn your IP, figure out how to attack the app and figure out how to steal data from it. It is easier for a nefarious actor to reverse a mobile app than it is to attack your back end your network infrastructure. That's why the bad guys have moved there. So what we want to do is have resiliency. So resiliency is basically anti-reversing. So there's techniques and strategies that you can use to bring up resilience. So this, this is actually an example of a, a tampering scenario, um, a hybrid scenario that was found and no one knows if it was actually tampered with. The medical formulary app. So doctors and pharmacists may create compound drugs to treat a certain condition. Well, it's not the fact that the drug is confidential, it's how it's mixed. So there was found an exploitability in the compounding app that was basically how to mix these compound drugs for like cancer and leukemia and things like that. And so a nefarious actor could potentially basically screw up the cocktail and kill somebody, right? Now, it doesn't have PHI in it, but it does need to be resilient because you don't want the IP stolen and manipulated effectively, right? And then obviously this is the big one. So this is where all the banking and retail apps live, which is not only do I need the defense and death side of the house, but I need resilience, right? I don't want to allow someone to steal my IP, steal my cred, steal PHI or PII or anything else. So this is my Medtronic drug delivery app, right? I don't want someone to be able to kill me by hijacking it and pumping me full of insulin or stop the insulin drip. 
right? Now, I use the healthcare one because everybody pays attention to it, but this could be this could be your Tesla app, right? This could be your television app, depending on what you're doing with the television, uh, and so on and so forth. So this model now gives us a framework where we can rapidly threat model an application. You can do threat model on a page using the threat modeling chapter of the MASVS. Threat modeling on a page, it's got like a checklist. Does it do this, and then it drops into one of these categories. And then once you get in one of these categories, it says, okay, this is what you should do for coding, and this is what you should do for testing. So we tried to simplify it. So when you think about 6 million apps in the Apple App Store, about a third of them, the half of them live here because they have a financial transaction or PHI, healthcare information in them, the rest of them can live over here. So if I have a portfolio of 20 or 30 apps, I can subdivide, you know, a couple of them invest a lot, invest a lot in, and the rest of them are invest less in, and some of them I don't even care about. Yet. How you do it, how you oh, I forgot. Yeah. So that's what I just said. So um, anyway, but there's some interesting things here, like the defense of depth hardening against a lost device. Uh, for more technical folks, looking at cert pinning and multi-factor authentication comes across here at the bottom. And we'll hit on each of these as I'm going to drill into this section as I talk about what are the kind of five key areas to pay attention to if you're developing or if you're testing it. No question. The FBI presentation at the Secure 360 talked about SIM swapping. How much is a SIM swap? Because you're talking about specific devices, securing it on a device. If someone SIM swaps, they can download all the apps you're running and make the device look like it's yours. And it's yeah, really so SIM swaps give you the ability to clone a phone. Yeah. So then that gets into um, what is it what is it that they can clone? So if you create a self-defending app, your app may or may not be advanced enough to do additional hardware-based attestation that am I actually on the right physical device, not just the SIM card. So for example, when you look, someone said PNC. Well, did I hear somebody say PNC? Hang on. Um, PNC is a customer. So um, some financial apps will actually use a, com a hashed combo of the MAC address, the phone number, and other intelligence data off the device in order to actually fingerprint the device and say, this is John Doe using this device. I happen to be a PNC customer, so I also know that it's fingerprinted my device. Um, but so if, if someone SIM swaps, then it will recognize, wait, I need to go through an entire multi-factor cycle because this is a completely new device I do not recognize. Right, well, so. But the, they were talking a lot of you, people were using it for cryptocurrencies. Yeah, because they're trying to hide hide their activities around cryptocurrency. Yeah. So the, the, there's a whole like world we can go into at the semiconductor and the SIM level of, of the mobile world. And you know, I always wondered why people didn't put SIM cards in laptops. Right? Why not make it easy? Like I got one in my phone. Why not put it in laptop? And actually, it creates a whole new attack vector on the laptop. Right? So it's actually good to not have SIM cards in your laptop. Use your phone and let that be the kind of front end and VPN. As it were. Still think they're going to do it someday. So um, from these four boxes here, we then created a set of eight uh, test capabilities. So um, for app code, there's MASVS code and resiliency. We're going to look at. We have the architecture. We have platform. We have authentication and network here and firm motion. We have crypto and storage here for data at rest. And for the API backend, we rely on the existing API top 10 and the existing ASBS for all the backend stuff in order to make it work. Why reinvent the wheel for the backend part of this? So I'm gonna talk through some of these as we kind of rock and roll our way through the story. Again, the interesting things to think about in this as I got deeper and deeper in this, and I took, took it for granted when I was at, at BlackBerry is, um, about 60 to 70, maybe even 75 percent, I just pulled a new data set, of all the vulnerabilities we find are actually in storage and data in storage and data in motion. That's where the bulk of issues are, and that's what you're going to see from the data that I'm about to show you. So um, if we organize those domains in an easier way to look at, so the first one is architecture, design, and threat modeling. That's the threat modeling in a page. Figure out which of the four quadrants you're in. Work through the checklist that says, I should do this, I should do this, I should do this, I shouldn't do that. It's even got guides that you hand to development and say, you should have security requirements like this because I threat modeled your app to live in this quadrant. Um, storage, crypto, authentication, and session management, network, environmental, code quality, and resiliency. This is the part where I talked about easy to reverse pretty much anything on iOS and Android and get the code uh, from that perspective as well. So, um, so what I'm going to do is I could 
spend three hours teaching you all of these, which will melt your mind and my voice will go. Um, we have benchmarked those millions of apps in the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store. Well, those benchmarks found patterns. So I'm going to show you the result of patterns. That's kind of your cheat sheet on what, where is all the bad stuff that you should focus on and how to do that. So that's the top five here. So we're going to use both Builder and Breaker. So we'll I'll talk about each one and then I'll give you what a developer should do and what a security analyst should do, right? In order to, to conquer that area. And we're going to go from, not totally from worst to best, but um, in the fun order. So storage and crypto, right? If you saw in there, there's two um, uh, MASVS sections for these guys. So 50% of all the apps in the app store have storage and crypto failures. So of all the apps that we can run through our automation engine, which is about four to five million of the six and a half million, about half of them have storage issues. So when you dig in there, right, it's basically improperly using the file system or something else without security controls, right? So there's lots of ways data gets stolen off the device. Now, stealing off the device we know is harder than stealing over the air because you got to have possession of the device, but there's, there's still ways to get there. So in each of these sections, you'll see I'll have the OWASP mapping and then I'll actually have links to the OWASP guidance, but I also have links to Apple and Android. So if you go back to how do you get a developer to write secure code that's easy for you to test, well, they need to write the code in the first place. Odds are pretty decent that your Android and Apple developers have not read all of the specs. They just got started with a simple development training skills, but they didn't learn how to do proper data data and file storage and manage crypto libraries. They didn't learn how to do file system basics on Android. So these links are actually to things that, that are like an hour's read and you're done, um, but they make a material difference in the ability of a developer to write secure code right out of the gate. In many instances, the most dramatic improvement in code we see in our customers is a little bit of training. Walk the developers down the path of what I'm doing right here. So avoid writing sensitive data to the device, duh. Um, what happens is, remember, developers are learning, hey, wait, I'm semi-offline. I don't want to have the expense of a round trip all the time. So I'm going to cache as much as I can. Well, sometimes it page right. Sometimes another app comes into the foreground. So I'm going to cache it onto storage. And then boom, because they're collecting typically more data than they need, and they're going to write it out to storage. If they're not doing it properly, then a lot of forensic materials can be left in storage that may or may not be encrypted and may or may not even should, should be there. And if you've worked enough with development, either from a security or QA perspective, you know the developers collect all kinds of data. All right, maybe I want some data about this. Maybe I want this performance metric. Maybe I want this, maybe I want that. They're trying to debug things and whatever else. You want this giant data cache effectively on it. Obviously you need to encrypt. Query strings are a great way to expose sensitive data, right? Um, and then from a secure storage perspective, iOS and Android has some secure storage capability use the right crypto. The amount of SHA-1 out there is amazing. Um, on Android, there's a, a library call called Secure Random that will help you with better randomization uh, for your key generation and make sure the key length is long enough, right? Classic brute force uh, type of things. So um, from, a, from a, that's a builder point of view, if we think about the breaker point of view, right? We need to think about looking for credentials and PII. So like we have frameworks people, we give people and say, you should test for this stuff, right? And it, it includes all the sensitive data you can imagine that are, that are in particular applications, but look at the IPC, look at the log files, look at the file system log files, look at your application level log files, because data could be spewed pretty much anywhere. Um, test the crypto, but look at it in the source code, you know, to see what, what level of cryptography is applied and does it match the risk of a particular application. Um, the app should always make sure the device has a password. If you think about it, even if you don't have multi-factor in your app, if you check at load time, does the device have a password? That's one step better to protecting your data. It's not true multi-factor, but it is like multi-factor. So without the device password, then if a nefarious actor gets a hold of it, it's faster for them to get to your data. And then watch for, for weak crypto, which is, which is pretty much notorious. We started one of the big things in uh, the IOXT work we did, which was the IoT mobile apps, um, was notoriously bad crypto. And so we actually built out a lot more testing and analysis around crypto, and it got worse the, digger, the, the deeper we dug. Uh, most developers don't seem to understand crypto. They assume if they do something, that's enough. 
they don't realize that a little crypto does not go a long way. Um, so it's a great opportunity to teach them kind of the right strategies. And inside um, the MASVS, there's some suggestions. We have companion documentation that if you do, the, if this kind of data is in your app, here's what you should use for key length crypto randomization, et cetera, uh, as basically as cookbook to make sure developers write, write the right code. So, um, so storage, you know, your risk team might say, well, someone's got to get a hold of a device. Well, assume they do. It's going to happen eventually. Some bad guy's going to have a device that has your app on it. It's going to get some data out of it. And it's not necessarily about the act of the attack of an individual. It's about the surveillance of what your app does so they can use it to brute force attack the back end. Right? So mobile has become a primary surveillance weapon for uh, nation states and criminal actors. And so you need to make sure your mobile's locked down just because you lock down your web. If all that stuff is sprawling in mobile, the amount of knowledge and intelligence they're going to learn from mobile, they can turn around and use on the web back end. And we've seen breaches like that. Uh, British Airways uh, breach was that way. So they learned a lot about the mobile app and then used the mobile app to hop through the firewall and then they were off and running. Mm -hmm. So Insecure Network, my second favorite at least. 48%, so they almost tie. Um, so I think this one's pretty obvious, right? So this is where your CVSS high scored uh, vulnerabilities are going to come through. Um, remember, I talked about the browser before. So the developer just needs to know HTTPS, activate SSL. I'm going to get a two-way TLS connection. I'm off and running all day long. Mobile is not that way. The developer has to know how to set up a connection. The developer has to know whether to use CERT pinning. They need to set up CERT pinning. They need to understand how to use certificates in the first place. And that's not something they have to understand when building a web application. So we get a lot of challenges on this one. This is typically the area developers know the least. And historically, Apple and Google in the early days didn't do a very good job of making it easy for developers to do secure network communication or to write secure code. The good news is they have solved those problems. So I'm going to jump all the way down here just because the order it's in. So uh, about four years ago, iOS added ATS, App Transport Security. By default, ATS is on. By default, Apple will encrypt all network transport for your application, and you don't have to worry about it. 42% of all apps in the App Store deactivate ATS to use their own network protocols. So Android, uh, about three, two, three years ago, added uh, network security configuration. It's almost the same thing. So it's the Android equivalent of basically configuring your certificate-based communication uh, and authentication chain. So uh, the good news is that unlike the old days when you had to roll your own, uh, they're now built in there. The other thing that developers tend to not understand, especially if they come from the web, is they don't understand what a man in the middle attack is or how it can happen. Uh, in terms of training, that's been one of our most effective things is the man in the middle of an app. So uh, sometimes we'll go in or we'll encourage a security analyst to take an app they've already built. And if you don't have one with a man of null attack, go and fat finger something to make, make it be exposed and then walk them through, load up burp suite, walk them through running the app and they can see what happens. They're like, oh, that's why I have to do it this way. So in some instances, the easiest fix is to turn ATS or uh, NSC back on, right? And, and get rid of, comment out all that code that they use to build their own network, set up and tear down. So, um, Test the TLS, test the cert pinning. It's easy to make mistakes on cert pinning if it's homegrown cert pinning. Um, in our testing, we test self-signed cert, improperly signed cert, anonymous cert. Uh, I can't remember what the fourth one is. I'm missing one. Um, invalid cert uh, against the app. And in some instances, they'll test one. They'll they'll check to make sure the cert's validated once, but not all go different ways. Um, or for the entire application session, they'll never revalidate. Right, even if the app goes in the background, then boom, I got to attack that in that perspective. Uh, check for the use of those APIs. This is easy. You can just go in the source code and find this. Are these guys deactivated or not? They have to explicitly be turned off in order to write your own network communications. So it's pretty easy to find it through static source uh, analysis. The other thing that's interesting, and this is, I'm going to use the words a little more anecdotal because we don't have the source code to the six million apps in the stores. Um, but when you do the analysis and you get it under the hood from more and more of them, um, we find that half or more of the vulnerabilities are actually third-party libraries. So your developers might be coding the app well, but the third-party library you're using to collect statistical data 
you know, is going off to some service here and it's using an encrypted communication or it's uh, sharing cookie information or something else that the developer didn't even know was at risk. And what's interesting about that is I'm going to talk about something going on at Google where the developer is now, as of Wednesday this week, the developer is now liable for what the third party libraries do with your data in the Google Play Store. So this will be interesting. All right. Now, now yes. Before we move on, you said 42% don't specifically deactivate ATS. Why would they do that? What? So you have two things. You have the history of iOS apps mm -hmm. where prior to ATS, you had roll your own, yeah. okay? So as developers grew up building that skill, what do they do? They reuse libraries they've written before. So you get this per perpetual motion created by prior, prior art effectively as they build new apps reusing old frameworks and old old uh, routines that they've written before. That's part one. Part two is that in some instances, for whatever reason, they think they've got a better mousetrap, right? So like Apple for years before they had ATS um, uh, recommended the use of TrustKit, which is a third party open source project started by Yahoo and some other organizations. Uh, and then when ATS came out, they said, stop using TrustKit, you can use this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the history for a lot of folks was to not use it. Some of the stuff you find in Stack Overflow will tell you to deactivate it because it might be calling your causing your network communication problems. So the actual debugging diagnostics are, oh, go disable this and then go see if the problem goes away. And sometimes people leave it off and they work around it. So Stack Overflow is your friend, right? So, um, so it's a good question. I mean, some of this is logic. Some of this is purely lack of education, purely lack of education. So to make so you're happy, there's one good stat in here. So um, we had early on seen a lot of authentication issues in, in our work five, six, seven years ago. These days, it's great. So Apple and Google have done a lot of work to improve authentication and authorization APIs. Developers are using them by default. By and large, they're pretty well designed. Um, so the result sets are, are quite good. Um, the way authentication works on, on the operating systems is a little bit different. Um, so developers just need to make sure that they understand that. Um, but the other thing to think about is it's not just about whether I'm authenticating properly on the client side, it's what's happening on the back end. So make sure that the authentication scheme or the authorization scheme is not in your IP on the device. Because if you're gonna get reversed, it means the bad guy's gonna figure out how you authorize and then they can use that to go after the back end. So an example of this that I'll, I'll proxy to is we had a, a company who came in and people were generating fake coupons. They couldn't figure out why. Because the coupon code generator was in the IP of the app, not the server side. And the app was not obfuscated. So boom, coupons coming out everywhere, right? So again, some of this is fundamental architecture thoughts. Anything like unique IP generation, I need to take the expense, I need to put it on the server, I need to put it behind the fence, I need to re-authenticate the user or re-verify the user, process on the back end, ship the coupon code down to the client. And same thing applies. So when we do workshops, we actually use the coupon code generator as an example to help because authorization schemes can be more complicated. The coupon code generation makes a really easy exercise. So, um, Make sure you terminate the active sessions. If you leave a session open for too long, it allows an attacker to continue to brute force attacks, obviously. Um, make sure that um, invalidation occurs. You know how you can do the tab and like the apps go like this? Well, forensic data of that can be found in memory if you know what you're doing, right? So that's why you'll notice, especially banking apps, when they go in the background, the screen goes blank, right? Or they'll just pop up their logo or something else. Uh, early on, uh, some banks were attacked when people figured out that that session data would be uh, left in the background. So it wipes memory, but it also invalidates the connection to the back end. So when you come in the front end, it's going to re-authenticate before you do any kind of um, action, trusted action uh, on the side. Um, clear memory, right? Don't store encryption forensic material in memory is a great one. Um, and uh, do your authorization on the server side. I talked about the, the coupon example there as well. So two big things are basically look at the data and memory and test session validation. When we do our analysis, we have the application hooked using Radare so we can see every memory call and you can quickly find PII unencrypted uh, just by looking at the live memory in the device. And that's oftentimes how the bad guys find it. 
All right, so uh, insecure code. So there are five. So take a look at insecure code. These like run the gamut, right? And if you're working in the web world or the network world, you've seen them too. So uh, about half of apps have a ton of insecure code in them. Uh, again, it's another high statistic. Android has more insecure code in it than iOS because Android developers tend to be a little sloppier uh, in terms of how they write the code. Um, it's hard for Apple and Google to say, don't use, don't write your code this way. So while the MASBS has a section on it that really isn't the equivalent of Apple and Google beyond all of their different diagnostic tools. So there isn't a pointer here or more. Um, but we do see logic flaws. We do see bad third-party libraries, buffer overflow still happen, uh, and so on and so forth. So, um, and there's all kinds of debug. So last data set I looked at had 6% of um, iOS and Android apps still had debug code in them. And they were in production in the app stores. So that's how it happens. So, uh, yeah, make sure you take out debug symbols. Um, use secure coding practice so your organization should have one. Um, iOS and Android both have some anti tampering uh, code quality type APIs in them, like stack protection, ARC, and so on and so forth. Um, and then pay attention to your software bill materials because the insecure code could be the third party libraries. I think we're all. The world is finally waking up to paying attention to SBOMs and third-party SDKs. Um, check the certs, checks for debug, look for hard-coded keys. Uh, about 12% of apps have a hard-coded key or something like that. Um, watch the error conditions as well. Developers, we all know, don't always handle error conditions as well. If you remember the fact that the app is reversible and now you've got live reversing tools running on the device, hooked in watching your behavior, make sure your error conditions are handled. Error conditions are how we started finding Peloton issues. So about a third of the Peloton issues were related to poor handling of error conditions. Uh, they also had issues related to uh, the tablet on the, 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 it's an Android tablet that is the screen. It had a much older version of Android that was unpatched. So there's all that kind of inherent mm -hmm. weakness under the hood, which then could be exploited for the bad things. And that happens, right? I mean, if you create, an IoT thing, how do you keep its own OS updated and all the rest? And that's kind of the notion. Um, log files are often bad. So reverse engineering. So what I said before, remember, is that an app can be reversed. So, and I am not a skilled reverser the way some of our team are, but it's amazing to watch them with what they do uh, and their ability to incrementally step their way through reversing an application. And the big thing to recognize is on Android, I can get all the way back to Java. And on iOS, I can get between assembler and the reversing, I can get 60 to 70% of the way to your IP without layered obfuscation. And so reverse engineering is highly utilized, not just by security researchers, but the bad guys in the world. And so we need to think about what am I going to do for anti-tampering, right? And tampering is so much harder in the web world because so much of your IP is behind the firewall. Now I got to think about what is the actual IP and what is the behavior of the app and how much does it mimic my back end? And what can I learn? So about a third of the apps have tampering issues. The good news is that Apple has DRM. So the DRM that goes that that is applied uh, when the binary is downloaded to your app and DRM, the app is downloaded to your device and it's DRM does make it harder. If you have the right tools, you can get through it. It slows you down uh, versus Java is like on there uh, from that perspective. So the majority of these issues do lean towards Android uh, versus iOS. Um, reverse engineering has become such a problem that there's actually an OWASP reverse engineering prevention project, uh, which is best practices that, are, that a number of reverse engineers are working on basically for anti-reversing. Uh, technologies. There's commercial vendors, there's open source tools, there's a variety of things there. And it's an interesting project um, to have a look at. Now, again, um, when you look at the overall marketplace, Frida Radari and R2 Frida are the primary reverse engineering tools. I'm sorry, my team did create them. Um, they're actually really good tools that have really strengthened the quality of software around the world. Um, so those are links to those repos if you want to want to learn your way through that, that world. Um, so uh, when we think about resiliency, then I'm thinking about, OK, what, what code and command calls should I be using? How should I organize my code? What architecture should I use to minimize the IP or uh, the IP on the client side? Because I know it's going to try, someone's going to try to reverse it, right? Um, the whole classic, if it's a banking app, you're more likely to be attacked than if you're like WebMD because there's money in the banking app, right? Crypto apps are famous for attacks. Um, so 
Uh, do use third-party obfuscation tools when you can, especially on Android, because Android is so much easier to reverse. Uh, what's really great on Android is they introduced the Safety Net API in Android 7 or 8. So basically, your app at load time can make a call to Safety Net, which will run a quick check on the device to see if the device is rooted and has been tampered with, and if it's running a reverse engineering tool in the background. Just unload your app. If Safety Net API returns false, stop the app load, you're done, right? It makes it much harder for a reverser to get around that because Safety Net API is an OS to hardware device call. Um, now, the uh, Android team is working on some more enhancements to that. Um, it's getting closer to device fingerprinting, which we'll see at some point. Um, and then there's a lot of other anti-tampering techniques. There's a handful of APIs from Apple and Google that you can find in the specs um, that can help you with that as well. Um, so on, on the testing side of the house, you have this conundrum, which is you need development to give you a build without the anti-tampering so you can test the app. And then after you've done all your testing, they filled all the issues, fixed all the issues you care about, then you need them to give you an app with the anti-tampering in, and then you need to try to tamper with it, right? If they're doing it right, the app will fail to load on a jailbroken or rooted device. If they're doing it right, it will fail to allow a debugger to attach to it. If they're doing it right, it will not allow a third-party app to manipulate data on the device and change the behavior of the app. So um, take a look at the string tables and again, safety net API. Apple doesn't really have an equivalent of that. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that tends to evolve. But as a general rule, a lot of Android devices are rooted. Very few iOS devices are jailbroken. It's so hard to do an iOS jailbreak now that it's just not the threat it was. It's mostly researchers and others that are doing things like that. And then our warning, this comes from the fact that we've been in many meetings. We're like, oh, we don't care about security. We just put anti-tampering in so no one can attack it. A vulnerable app is still attackable whether or not it's got anti-tampering. If I am not properly encrypting data over the network, anti-tampering isn't going to change the fact that I'm not encrypting data over the network, right? So there are a lot of developers who come back and say, but I'm doing this so no one can get to it because they think somehow it makes security vulnerabilities and bugs go away. No, it doesn't. It just makes it harder to reverse. It doesn't mean I can't steal your data still. So we say use anti-tampering, but fix the damn bugs first. So that was, that was kind of our, our, uh, our big list. What I try to do is give you the where to hunt. Um, we uh, give away this training effectively. You can take it to your development team. You can take it to your security team and have at it. All these links all throughout this are all open source content, meaning it's Google content, OS content, iOS, uh, Apple iOS content, and all the rest. But a few more things I want to show you. So there's cool things that are coming now. Um, but as a general rule, when we, when we work with organizations on establishing a, a mobile security program, recognize that web and mobile are different. You need to become smart on the differences. Assume your mobile developers have fewer security skills than they need to be successful. So find ways to use a little bit of training and mentoring. You don't have to send them to college for it. You can do a little bit of training that goes a long way. If you think about what I just showed you today, we have like 15 minute chapters for each of those five. They're not rocket science. Watch a video, go to the links, read the pages, you're done. Most of it's do this, don't do that, right? It's pretty straightforward in terms of locking down your application. Um, build a toolkit. I'm going to give you a toolkit. So like if you want to go into reversing yourself or you want to become a mobile security analyst, I'm going to give you a toolkit in a second. Stack of resources you can use. Um, read the MASVS and the MSTG. It will take you a long time. Um, they're about that thick. Uh, combined, but the reality is if you use the MASVS, it will give you the guidance and then the MSTG is basically your checklist of how to test. Inside the MSTG, if you sort of think about testing, it tries to give you the entire edge of the envelope. So if I have an L2 super high risk anti-tamper app, I need to do all 22 checks in this particular category. If I've got a less risky app, maybe I need one, maybe I need none, right? So continue to work on your effort at that level, which is really great. And sign up for the project. The OS mobile project has, uh, we've been talking a lot in public the last three years since the modernization. And uh, there's about 60 active contributors now, which still looking for more. When I say active, that means they're in the repo at least once a month, doing something, participating somehow. Uh, we actually had a guy do design work. So that pretty blue screen was someone who like redesigned. We have a, a two folks that are just working on the docs themselves, just quality of documentation. We you know, their doc quality is always an issue. 
So um, OWASP mobile project is now passing the web project in terms of its capabilities. I'm gonna show you some of what's coming imminently and then what's coming after that. So if you, if you practice, if you leverage the OWASP resources and you think about how the ASVS has evolved, if you looked at the IPI top 10, they've really been designed around here are the best practices of what you should do. What we're trying to get to MASVS is automatable testing in a box. So how can I write tooling, testing, or scripting that would enable the bulk of MASVS and the MSTG checklist to be done automated and a few things done with a human? There's things that human ingenuity can't necessarily replace, but could I get to 80% automation and 20% manual? Could I recognize that the mobile project shouldn't have all the web stuff in it? So we peel them apart and say, hey, go use ASVS for your back end and focus on the front end. So there's a lot of logic in this. So you'll hear about V2. Uh, we are well through V2. So we've been through one, two, three, four, five uh, sections of V2 have been refactored and updated and modernized. Um, we're inside of auth right now. Essentially the way this works is the core working group comes up with proposals. They publish the proposals and run for about a month on feedback. And at the end of the month, they take all the feedback and then they work on hardening it and finalizing it. So this is basically July, August, September. So at the end of September, we'll have been through everything. And then in Q4, we're going to finish up the documentation and publish officially V2 stamped. I'll show you some of the pieces of where you're going to get it. So there's the repo. You can see kind of what's going on in the repo. Here's an example of the interaction. We're using a, uh, a refactoring tool so people can see how things are changing over time. Um, a lot of what happened in MAS VS V1 was let's get everything. You know, that classic everything. And then there's like, yeah, but everything's a lot for apps, right? And, and I don't have enough pen testers to test everything. It's going to take me a month to test it. And there's some tooling maybe that speeds it up. So how do we make it more practical? And that's a lot of what's been going on. Um, so what it's going to look like is code, internal, external, key store, logs, memory, data privacy, right? All of this data, right? Data at rest is whole giant area. You have the data in use on the device and you have the data and then you have working over the network. So what's effectively happened, if I use this as an example, of here's a chunk of data at rest, here's data in use and all data, what we've actually done now is logically mapped out the sub subsections and then created tests, atomic tests at the individual level. So before it was like, here's the envelope, you need to do 22 things in this envelope. Now it's like, well, pick the test you wanna care about, right? So if I'm worried about caching, I can do these tests and I don't have to pay attention to the other ones. Or let me choose which of the encrypteds I care about and so on and so forth. So what you'll see is we're, we're making atomic levels. And as you get to atomic levels, it makes it easier to layer automation in. It also makes it easier to train a team to go do the work, right? Which is ultimately what we're trying to get to. So where this ends up is compliance code. So MASVS V2 will have an automatable and manual category. And automatable will be between 80 and 90% of it. Which is pretty freaking amazing. So if you manually pen testing the web world, because of the way the spec is written and the kind of tools or lack of tools that we have, there's a lot of work to do there. What's great about this is we're going to be able to get to a higher degree of automation, which allows us to get to scale. So the way that's going to work basically is, you know, human in the traditional world, right? You have the read and you got to figure out, we have control coverage and how's it working. And there's like OWASP projects comparing different tools SAST and DAST and so on and so forth. And all of this stuff with the humans and all the manual documentation we know doesn't work very well. So could I get to a world where I had a machine readable checklist that would scan my app? And can I have an engine that will do that on my behalf? And how much of that can I automate? Which pieces do I need human? Now this obviously presumes that the anti-tampering, anti-automation technology is turned off so I can do this uh, from that perspective, right? But now you get provability. Right now, you could have a global clearinghouse like for the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store. It says, Shh, I ran the scan, it passes MAS VSL2, send it out the door. Right. And if we think about that, that allows us to change to let developers write as fast as we can. We've got the safety net that's going to catch where they miss and it can run autonomously. And I don't need a large security team to babysit the little developers. 
right? And I can build this into development tools. I can build this into CICD infrastructure. I can build it into back end. So that's pretty much where we're going. And here's the way it's going to look. So we have L1 and L2 and R provided by the MASPS. And then we're having community created. So I'm going to tell you about the Google project in just a section, just a second. The Google project is taking this and wrapping automation around it in the Google Play Store. So all of this stuff is going to go like this over the next couple of months in terms of alignment. The IoT, that's the IOST stuff I talked about earlier that was built on the OSBEM ASPS. Uh, there's a major healthcare initiative going on right now for health tech that's phenomenal. They're trying to create automated PHI analysis effectively is what they're trying to do. Um, and again, they're using a derivative of the MASPS and trying to drive automation to that as well. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, what makes it interesting when we think about the overall business goals, the business goal is I want to ship new functionality fast that meets my customer requirements, right? That's generally why people build apps. So how do we help them do that and have security built in as a baseline instead of security at the tail end, right? And mobile has gotten to the point with the maturity of the operating systems and tools. And if we evolve the spec to get there, we're not making the spec weaker. We're deciding what really matters or not, not what's the universe of everything I can test for. It's where are the vulnerabilities looking at six and a half million apps in the app stores to determine what the right profiles are, what to test for and what not to. So that's a way to apply intelligence. So uh, we do a lot of these remotely. So this is so people can take a screen, <laughs> take a, uh, we call it a photo capture uh, in a giant uh, thing, but the link is here as well. Um, there is also a lot of activity going on in Slack. So if you're in the Slack channels around the other specs, jump into the couple Slack channels around uh, MASVS. We'd love to have you come and participate uh, within that. And so any, any questions on any of this? Because I'm going to tell you about some cool stuff with Apple and Google and like take an orthogonal thing here and run down the Apple Google path of iOS and Android things coming your way. All right. Is that useful? I hope. Sure, it was interesting. You can go home and say, I don't know if I want apps on my phone. <laughs> so you probably saw that Apple is sledgehammering the rest of the market with privacy. And so in order to submit an app, into the Apple App Store, you have to make att self attestations around privacy. And if you haven't looked recently, you can actually look inside an app and see what's actually going on. So in this world, as an Apple developer, I have to submit what data is tracked, what data is linked, and so on and so forth. And then Apple exposes that in an app interface so you can see what's going on with your apps. And so, you know, overall, they've been kind of hammering privacy in the market. Uh, now for what, like 18 months, two years, something like that. Um, and it's interesting because it's privacy as long as Apple gets to control it, but it's still privacy. So um, Android is doing the same thing now with one better. So last fall, uh, the Android developer blog announced that data safety labels were coming. And so if you have an Android device, you go look at Android apps, you'll see some of them have safety labels on them already because they've been working on that since last fall. Uh, it becomes mandatory on Wednesday. So on Wednesday, no developer will be able to upload a new app or update an existing binary in the App Store without filling out a safety label. Now, legacy apps that don't get updated won't be, don't have to have a label. They're not going to take people down. They just are gating your, your path in. And so this is an example. The apple on the left, the example on the right is the data privacy and security now uh, inside of uh, the Android world. App collects eight types of data, location information, photos, financial info, what have you. Um, and this comes in two flavors. So the first flavor is self-attestation. So I, as a developer, when I upload the app, I fill out, here's the data that I'm manipulating, right? And if you think about it, you might think, well, can't, can't Google figure that out? Well, Google doesn't have a giant dynamic test engine that can authenticate into your application and track all the data it uses and make sense of it. So they need the developer to say, here's what the app does. Right. So both of them have this notion of self attestation, which makes it more transparent to the user uh, in order to do it. But Google went a step further. So Google now has an uh, 88 developer program, the App Defense Alliance, that uses the OWASP MSTG and MASVS to add a section to the data label called an independent security review. So basically, this is one of four labs. Now, Secure happens to be one of them that can go apply semi-automated and human augmented MASPS and MSTG analysis 
to your Android app and you pass or fail. And when you pass, you get an independent security review badge. So now any user of that app can be confident that what that app says it does or doesn't do with your data, it does or doesn't do with your data because it's been independently verified by a third party. So as far as I know, there is no software regime in the world that has independent certification through an app store like this. There are some other software certification regimes like do I get PCI certified or something to that effect, but that's not certifying the whole app, that's certifying the PCI oriented transactions. So this will be very interesting to kind of see what happens in the marketplace. So if you're like in an organization that's building mobile apps, uh, you can see, um, or updating mobile apps, you need to be ready for this. Now you don't have to do the independent security review. You can just do that. But what we believe is gonna happen is that more and more people, especially in regulated markets, are gonna take on the independent security review. One of the interesting things about it, we were talking with a, a consortium of uh, 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 cyber insurance companies. And they're going to use this as a factor in determining uh, insurance rates. So if you have an independent security review, you'll get a lower insurance rate, cyber insurance rate, as a full example. Uh, security scorecarding companies like BitSight and um, uh, Security Scorecard uh, are starting to use that as a judge of how good is your perimeter and so on and so forth. So while the web apps are kind of a wild frontier and PC apps and, and Apple apps to a degree, this now is an independent certification scene. Now, what's cool about this is that when MAS VS 2.0 is done, and then we release our next generation software and Google releases the next generation app store, it'll all happen automatically in the background. So the little bits of human labor, the 20, 30% of human labor that's still there will disappear as we get into next year. So then it will truly be, I can self-attest, boom, push a button. I can get an independent security review, get the badge and we're off and running, which again will drive Android velocity. So inside it, if you're if you dig your way into the MSTG, this is the actual massive spec that app that Google is using. But inside it, every section just points to MSTG, 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 MSTG. So this convergence is occurring between what's going on in Android and what's going on in OWASP at the same time. You get to a standard set of background. It's pretty cool. Don't see the world consolidating with web that way. It's not that web is bad, it's just fascinating to watch all of it. So um, software bill of materials, uh, since it's an OWASP, please pay attention to this. Steve Spriggett and Patrick Dwyer are doing great work on software bill of materials. They've created machine automation, machine analytics around this. So you can have interchangeable uh, SBOM data and build a giant SBOM factory in your organization or analysis. We've taken their tool and generated SBOMs for a couple million apps. Apple and Google Play stores, you should see what we're finding in there. Um, so anyway, so uh, dependency track is a really cool tool. Uh, GitHub just released uh, an update to Dependabot that includes web and mobile sourcing as well. Uh, so it's a great project to get involved in if you're not otherwise involved in it. And uh, with that, you can get the free project tooling and then we've got free mobile S-bombs. So if your business builds mobile apps, you can just start downloading these like crazy. So we reverse a mobile binary because we can get to source, we can tell you the libraries that are there. So we get about 80 to 85% of mobile libraries. We get the versions if we can. So it's just gonna depend on um, open source or our own database about where we can get all the way to the versions of the libraries, which is pretty cool. So our goal is to continue to grow that. That's SBOM land. Last few resources. So if you wanna build your own toolkit, so you need the MASPS and MSTG, download free and Radari, you need a networking tool like Burp or Zed, uh, you need jailbreak and rooted devices and you too can become a mobile pen tester in a month. So on our uh, academy site, I'm gonna give you a link in a second. You can actually take all the classes and learn how to do this in all your own. So we have a whole program around becoming a mobile pen tester, uh, which you can have at it. And uh, part of the reason we give it away is the world needs more mobile security people. So we're just trying to entice more folks to get involved in that. Um, there's also automated testing and using commercial software, and that's that side, right? So we have the open source side and we have the paid for software side. We've got a whole lot of tools that can help organizations do that. The uh, SBOMs, uh, basic reporting and online training are all free in our world. Um, and there's stuff we pay, you can do paid analysis with. One of the things that uh, NASCAR has done is, if you think about the traditional like security tooling vendors, they're like, okay, we're a SaaS vendor. 
then we're going to build a great SaaS, and then maybe we'll buy some other stuff to give us more than SaaS. Like, look at Synopsys, they just bought White Hat, they buy everybody, right? So, um, so you got that kind of strategy, right? Or Veracode, there's like, well, we're not going to do source, we're going to do binary, so we're going to have this binary analysis engine, and so on and so forth. What we didn't say, what tool do we want to have? We said, what do we want to test for? And then we're backwards to what tool do you need? So under the hood, the way our tools work is we have SAS and a DAST and an IS product in an API scanner. But it's an all-in-one because what we care about is the MSTG. We don't care about, is this a SAS thing that I'm going to sell you or a DAST thing I'm going to sell you or an IS thing? We don't have that like religious argument about which tool is better. It's like, how do I get test output, test analysis and output that fits the attack surface? And so we just bundle it all in. So it's just like how many apps you got, boom, you get the whole thing uh, from that perspective, which has been a really interesting experience for me. So my head of product marketing came from Veracode. And he talked about how Veracode like skins everybody to slices and slices of charges to roll up multi-million dollar deals. We do it a different way. How many devs you got? How many apps you got? How deep you want to test? Boom, the whole thing. So uh, use or not, it's, it's a wild ride. Ooh, that's weird. Um, so where the world is going, then is this idea of, for my low, medium and high risk applications, I'm gonna do automated continuous testing most of the time because I've got the MASVS in there. It's gonna do it most of the time. And then when I need to, I will drop in and do some manual testing, right? So for example, if I have anti-automation techniques, someone still needs to test multi-factor and CAPTCHA. So I'll automate an, a version of the app that doesn't have CAPTCHA or MFA or something else like that, but then, when it's time to test those, that's going to be a human condition. Or the work we do with IOXT around testing IoT connected things. Well, we test cars like Tesla and Ford and, and you know, robots like iRobot running around vacuum cleaning the floor, but we stub it out. And so we test the software side, the mobile app software and services side. Then a pen tester cracks it open and literally has the iRobot app open and the robots on the floor and they're working with it. And an hour later, the pen test is done because 80 or 90% of it's done automated. So. It's pretty cool because now if I get more continuous testing, then I have just a smaller amount of manual testing that I need to do on the other side. So here's Now Secure Academy. Uh, on the left, academy.nowsecure.car, it, it is all free. There's two paid certifications if you want. So if you actually want to become a certified pen tester or you want to become a certified software, secure software developer, you get to pay for the, basically the use of the logo and your certification, you take a test at the end. Um, but otherwise it's all free. It's, it's really great stuff. It's what we use to train new employees. We've cross licensed it to a lot of organizations. So some SANS classes you take have this under the hood. A number of large um, software vendors have licensed the content in it and embedded it in their commercials, uh, commercial software. And then we do events all the time. So uh, now Secure Connect is our big annual virtual conference we do every fall. There's like 60 sessions worth of training. Uh, that's all available. If you go there, we'll be doing it again this fall. We don't have the reg page up yet again. We get like security people from all around the world doing a whole variety of things. Um, it's not really a con. It's more like a training uh, from, from that perspective. Um, and then links, if you want, so submit here, we'll give you S bombs, submit there. We'll give you a security report and actually show you some fun things. Dumpster diving in the app store. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to show you in a minute, which is kind of fun. Um, and then there's other kinds of resources. Uh, the Crack Me for Android over here is a great uh, example. So this was the R2 community that built our reversing tool, got together and has been building Crack Me's for the OWASP project as well. So I'm saying people work together. There's a bunch of fun Crack Me's out there that you can mess with, especially if you're working on reversing skills. The Crack Me's designed to teach you reversing skills while going through the Crack Me. It's pretty cool. So uh, we have a bunch of software and services and, and that's all good. I wanna to get to actually the fun stuff in a minute. Um, so Corona Facts. So Corona Facts was a very popular application produced by a government agency in Europe that helped uh, consumers in Europe track the spread of Corona and eventually track you know, uh, adjacent exposure and uh, um, their own PHI related to Corona. We did do a responsible disclosure for password exposed and modifiable over the network, email exposed and modifiable over the network, and that app is still in production today with no encryption and leaking credits. So the user experience you're looking at. So 
I talk about scanning the app store. So we have a cloud-based software package that you can upload a binary into. You can integrate it like with a Git repo, pull the code out um, or scan the app store. So this is from mass scanning of the app store. We find these nasty apps and we go try to help get them fixed. Um, so you can see here, we CVSS score the results. So that's an 8.1, uh, super high. You see the email here, you see some other stuff that we found and we grade applications. So when you look at our risk dashboard, you'll see grades ranging from zero to 100 and we grade an app kind of like school. So 90 to 100 is an A, 89 is B, 70 is C, so 25 is a train wreck um, from that perspective. So don't use Chronifax. Now, you're not living in Europe, so you probably won't. Um, the other thing we do is we figure out where your data is going from your apps and your third party library. So TurboLock is, Turbo Lock is the number one selling IoT door lock in the United States. <laughs> and it's built in China and it sends all your data to China. So it sends your creds and your geolocation to China. So it knows the address of where the device was installed. It knows its MAC address. So the Chinese know everything. We talked about TikTok earlier. This is way scarier than TikTok uh, from that perspective. And you can see like Huawei and a bunch of other fun people participating in TurboLock. So don't buy TurboLock doors for your business or your house. Um, we find other interesting things like every operating system has outdated libraries that have security flaws, right? This is your classic SCA problem that uh, everybody faces. Um, this one was particularly nasty because there were like a million, 1.2 million apps in the app store that were using the old vulnerable version of this and most of them still haven't been updated. So we actually raised the CVSS score to 7.1 to try to get people to see it and pop it as a, hey, you really ought to go deal with this. It should hit your high bar criteria of, you know, stop and don't release again without fixing it uh, as a cycle. And there's a handful of those in mobile just in the same way we have Log4j out there. Um, but the other interesting thing that happens is the rapid development release cycles, we see new code get introduced, new vulnerabilities get introduced. Code gets introduced, new vulnerabilities. So this app, uh, PM COVID, I can't remember what country that is. This, I think it's a Nordic country. Um, really great app. 77, 76, right? Lots of good scoring, lots of good scoring, lots of good scoring. Oops. Oops. Bad third party library. Bad third party library. Um, so that was them getting hit with the nano PB, right? So this had been secure until there's a build version that was insecure, right? So they don't necessarily look at our output every day when they see the score change, like, hey, wait a minute, I should pay attention to that. The score changes. Uh oh, I need to go do something. Um, so let's go fix that. So um, when we talk about that automation, right now, that automation can actually be plugged into the infrastructure. So while we're continuously scanning the app stores, we can do that in a, in a pipeline. So here's my uh, Jenkins Jira demo. So I got my Jenkins pipeline it's plugged in. The app gets built by the pipeline. It then calls the cloud software. That's a weird build. Um, automatically runs the tests and then pumps the tickets into Jira. So when I talk about that automated scanning with MASVS 2.0, that's this kind of thing. We just plug it in and it runs. It generates tickets to the developer inside your development environment, but it'll also happen in the app stores here as you can get in the next year, which will make everything more secure because you have this automation that eliminates human fallibility and can scan every day, literally. Good build. Um, there's a lot going on with GitHub repos. So, if you haven't looked at what GitHub's doing with security, take a look. So they bought a couple of security companies. They've embedded security in the repo. They've got Dependabot running in the repo now for SBOMs. So there's a bunch of really interesting Git, GitHub things they've been doing. They brought us in because they didn't have a mobile solution. They bought web security, but they didn't have mobile. So we're doing a lot with mobile embedded inside of your GitHub repo and inside of the GitHub workflows, which is pretty cool. Um, so we launched a GitHub action in November, it's got over a thousand implementations now. We launched the Dependabot SBOM generator a couple of weeks ago. It's already got about 60 or 80 uh, implementations using it now. So it's just basically raising the bar. What's cool about this is it runs autonomously in the background. So a security analyst doesn't need to manage it. And the developer just gets tickets. There's a ticket, hey, I found this. Generate pull request, update this library, what have you. It's just really cool. And that's it. That's my show and tell. Done. So questions, comments, thoughts? Throw the phone out the window. Might be a little out of scope for this meeting, but um, you mentioned third party libraries being a source of insecurity in mm -hmm. a number of instances. Is there 
any kind of effort to look at those and uh, yeah. at least make them less of a problem the the, tool or the what's what's interesting is if you look at the uh the web world there's companies like sonotype and black duck and synopsis now um who have been building sort of sea libraries and we went to them and said hey could we cross license your mobile libraries and they said my what so the 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 leading companies sneak is another one sneak's got some java and that's it so none of the three biggest companies in SCA actually have anything for mobile. So we're building one now. So we got a giant harvester that is cranking up to build one. So we'll have SCA next year. Um, right now we find about two dozen libraries, but there's literally hundreds of thousands of libraries we need to get through eventually. So um, we're also working with, um, Google has a project called the SDK index where Google is trying to get to uh, attribution and attestation of what all these uh, Android libraries are doing. So if you're in the Android side of the house, there is a resource there. So we're starting to match up our data with theirs. So that you could generate an SBOM and then go look at their data and say, oh, this SBOM is this SDK that Google has mapped that has these behaviors that I need to know. Right now, they're predominantly tracking what does it do with your data because of the data safety labeling thing that I talked about. But it's it's also the Project Zero team is tagging things as um, as malicious or vulnerable as well as they go. So the SDK list is much longer in terms of what are they than the vulnerability list, but it's being built out over time. The App Defense Alliance, it's a group of about eight of us. We're all harvesting that data. So we'll eventually have the database for mobile. It's just a function of time and resources to get there. So, and the, the Google part of it's free. So it doesn't have iOS, but it's free from the Android side of the house to access. Google, as I said earlier, Apple was secure, more secure at first. Google has been strategically investing in it. So now depending on how you look at the data, um, they're both a lot more secure than they used to be, but Android's doing some really interesting things. Other questions, comments? Hey, Brian, I'm, I'm online, yeah. if you can hear me. Yeah. Hey, thanks. Um, yeah, just want to say thanks for the presentation. I'm actually, uh, uh, I work for a penetration testing company in Minneapolis here. So um, I, I test web and mobile applications and, and use uh, quite a number of the things that you were talking about uh, tonight. Um, the Radari, I'm interested in that. Um, just trying to learn more about reversing is, uh, I guess, kind of two points. Well, mainly just one question is, this slide deck I might have missed. Is it going to get shared out so that I can maybe dig into some of the, the resources and things? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Guys, yeah, so, well, how are you distributed? You'll have it tonight. Yep. Your your host will have it tonight, so he can share it out. You're welcome to it. It is full of links. You saw them everywhere. So jump through those links. The other thing I'll say is, in some number of weeks, a Radari course is going to show up in Academy. So um, we've had a big ask for that. So the developers of Radari have been on and off working in the background to create a training class. So a Frida class and a Radari class are in development. My understanding is they're due by uh, late this quarter or beginning of next quarter. The whole idea is that you could do the introductory to intermediate courses in it to become productive with the tools. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, that's, uh, that's great news. I think a lot of people, you know, at my company and as we kind of onboard new penetration testers and stuff this could uh this could be awesome for us to, to use as a resource so appreciate it yeah so a lot of a lot of pen testing companies are using our academy as a training tool and most of it's free so just go there and, and go looking through the resources there you can use that um, ncc group um ibm zone pen testing team uh come to mind as uh, bishop fox um, they all use some of our training to train their new mobile pen testers. So thanks for coming along for the ride. Yeah, thank you. Other comments, questions from remote or in the room? Rebecca, I got another one. This is a, a FIDO is potentially very exciting going passwordless. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that and kind of what do you think we'll see in the next few months next year and so on so um we have some people in in the pro project um that know it better than i do what i'm hearing is a combination of things which is we all know passwords are the bane of our existence so um if 
the promise of FIDO materializes that a sufficient number of systems and applications use it, then we will slowly eliminate weak points, right? So if you think about a dam, it only takes one crack, yeah. right? The dam has to be solid. So the question is, um, will every organization agree to get involved with FIDO and then take advantage of it? Or am I still gonna have passwords for half my apps and then I'm gonna have FIDO-based alternative passwords for the other one? So there's that whole adoption curve mm -hmm. challenge. Um, technically, it, it is highly, hugely viable uh, in terms of what it can actually do. I think the fact that I believe all 10 of the top software companies in the world, IBM, Microsoft, uh, Apple, Facebook, et cetera, Amazon, are all in it and agreeing to do it. So that means that, you know, sort of the inverted 80-20 rule of the biggest companies in the world are going to implement it. Um, it will be fascinating to see what happens to all the identity companies what that means. Fido is passwordless, but is not dealing with your um, authorization side of, you know, do you get access to this or access to that? So some of those guys will run a Fido later, layer over it because those guys are really understanding who should have access to what data on the back end, which it doesn't. So um, we hope, hope that final implementations will make it easier for us to do automated authenticated testing. So, um, if you think about trying to do automated authenticated testing today, you have to figure out how to log into an app. So if that app has hardcore CAPTCHA, multi-factor auth or other things, we can't automate that. FIDO would let us automate it. So security will improve and the ability to test security will improve also, which, is, which we think is a great thing. So there's been lots of promises about all kinds of stuff. Hmm. So. I uh, feel pretty good about that, right. subject to it. Uh, Apple and Google will be implementing things. We, well, we don't know about Apple, but we believe Apple will because Apple never tells us about anything. But we know Android is working active, very actively in the clients. So uh, we'll probably see some good stuff. I think if you think about planning horizon, we'll be later. <coughs> so it's picking up more steam. All the carriers now have people uh, working on FIDO as well. So that'll help on the mobile side of the house. So Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, Entity Docomo, Asians, Asian Tiger, folks are involved, uh, Vodafone in Europe. So our carrier side of the practice is seeing a ton of activity. So it's, a, it's to their advantage. Thanks. Sure. I find, has there been any, saying, yeah, like a, for, like categorization or kind of with a collection of like say with insecure backend libraries for between like java or swift so the list i was kind of go through earlier there isn't a good central repository for all that beyond the standard cd database kind of thing we're working on building it um q1 q2 next year will be a decent database people can use so uh, the, like i said um on the Android side of the house, Google's doing some work. There's the equivalent on the iOS side of the house. So we'll see how that evolves. But the vulnerability and, and the misbehaving libraries are out there. Some of them just aren't vulnerable. They may be misbehaving, like routing your data to a third world country. Things like that. So it has been fascinating that traditional SCA vendors have not addressed the vulnerability well. Mobile tends to dominate usage of these things. It's a hard nut to crack. Mobile is very hard to do. If you're a web testing vendor, the software automation you built to do web testing is very different than from mobile. It's hard for them to build software to actually solve the problem. I find also that do uh, like kind of like testing of I see the growing popularity on smartwatches, I say for the security. Um, yeah, so um, right there is there is some so the most of the IoT connected mobile testing that's gone on has been the mobile app resident on the smartphone talking to the thing. So like my, you know, my Amazon Ring doorbell app talking to Ring doorbell. One team tests the Ring doorbell, another team tests the mobile app that talks to it. Um, there are definitely teams out there working pretty heavily on uh, automotive and on wearables. And they're pretty well, pretty well locked down. Our head of research, uh, Don Isbell is famous. She was the first one to, uh, Reach the eye watch, so the Apple Watch. She had the first uh, bounty on uh, 
on an iOS device. Not on an iOS wristwatch. But like there's some like Apple watches that go directly to the web there. Don't go through uh, a phone. I have one of those. Carry based watch. So um, the wearables generally have been good. The, the worst nightmare has been uh, system infrastructure tools like Strava. Strava is the back end to many of the wearables that, that athletes and military people use to track their training. Uh, Strava had a massive breach a couple of years ago where they discovered that the uh, Russians, uh, Iranians, Israelis, North Koreans were tracking US soldiers through Strava. Um, and if you caught the news three weeks ago, it was discovered that Strava has another ball and that people were tracking the Israeli troops. So um, sometimes it's not the app, the device, it's the service and what the service is doing. And a lot of these apps use all these services in the same way the web does. So it could be the service that you're nightmare. So just because I happen to have the Strava app for when I go running doesn't mean that I can trust Strava, right? So I'm using the Apple sensors in this, but if I link my Apple sensor data to Strava, then I'm at the mercy of what your Strava does. So that's fine. Uh, US military has become trying to do a lot more like, security conscious of, like, say, for soldiers, especially overseas uh, bases, like, say, wearing things like that would give off signals like that to be able to track and be able to, like, okay, here's the biggest, the biggest thing we, we put together a bunch of stuff with the Department of Defense and the State Department. The biggest thing is the consumerization of IT where a federal employee has an American iPhone or Android device, walks off the plane in Berlin. And it beacons, hey, I'm an AT&T iPhone from Washington, D.C. Here's who I am. <laughs> um, and then you get something like Facebook or Instagram, all those social media apps just broadcast spew everywhere. So we've done a lot of work on just building out hygiene training. Don't use the apps. If you use the apps, configure them this way, uh, and so on and so forth. So like um, State Department operates in countries that aren't very safe. And so uh, we help them do an analysis of like, hey, if you go to like Indochina or you go to the Philippines, which taxi app is safe, which news app is safe, because those governments have figured out how to use those apps to track people. So um, the, one of the interesting things to think about the app is there's the vulnerability, but there's the data harvesting and tracking side. And there's a lot of data harvesting going on around tracking. So, and that was, there was, remember there was a face, face app that came out of the Middle East that was like, make your face get old. That one, yeah, that was the uh, that was the uh, Saudis trying to harvest facial data and build a data build a, a facial recognition platform. The general belief is TikTok is the same thing that the Chinese are trying to build facial recognition. It's the largest database of faces in the world. There, are, I will run almost any app. I do not have TikTok. I don't have Facebook. TikTok's been really going for doing that sort of thing with certain populations of people and tracking their movements and yeah. so on and so forth. And Same with Facebook. So it's, it's no Facebook. reason to believe that would have changed. Yeah, I mean, there, there are, um, there's a lot of things they're doing internally. Um, senior members of the uh, Treasury Department and Secret Service and the NSA actually now work for TikTok USA. And they're actually trying to build a standalone firewall version of their code. Uh, we're basically to see how that evolves or whether it's actually successful. They've at least hired some high power people. It's a fun world. So uh, thanks everybody for the time. Um, certainly if your business is building mobile apps, we can help take advantage of the open source stuff and learning. Give Tanner a shout if you need more. So appreciate the time today. We will be having a virtual connect probably in the fall be another learning exercise. Bring the team virtually if you want. Take, take advantage of the academy on that. So. And I will share the deck tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we had a few questions and comments. You get one. You get one. There's a mug in there for you. Thanks for joining everybody.
Yeah, thanks for 